Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello dear learners, I am Dr. Himani Singh working as an assistant professor with Institute of Business Management, GLA University, Mathura. I welcome you all to the session 11 of the course that's professional communication for managers and session 11 is on negotiation at workplace. Dear learners, by the end of this session, you all will be able to understand that how negotiations are meaningful and important to the business world and not just this, I am going to relate and tell you that how negotiation and communication is so interlinked. Also in this session, I am going to highlight and tell you about different approaches of negotiation with the process of negotiation as well as the factors which tends to influence your negotiation skills at workplace. Also I am going to highlight in this session about some of the common mistakes which we tend to commit when we are sitting on the negotiation table as well as that how and what skills are required, what strategies are required to become a successful negotiator. So now moving towards the concept that what we mean by negotiation. Negotiation is a term which is originated from a Latin word that is negotiatius, which means to carry on business. If I talk about negotiation, it is more about dialogue which people tend to do and it is intended somewhere solve or resolve some kind of conflicting ideas which both the parties are having. Now if I talk about negotiation, negotiation is not a new thing. In fact, you people can relate negotiation with your daily life. Every other day, every other minute in a day, you are negotiating. Sometimes you are negotiating with your mother over some different cuisine or else you are negotiating with your teacher over the marks or else at workplace you are negotiating your salary with the employer. So what's that? Somewhere or the other both the parties they are having some common or some conflicting interest for which you are somewhere trying to come on a common consensus. So yes, we can say that negotiation occurs everywhere, whether it is about business or non-profit business organizations or else legal proceedings or in our personal lives as well. Now, if I talk about the formal definition of negotiation, yes, it is a process in which two or more, two or more individuals or groups who have some common as well as conflicting interest. Now that's the important part of this definition that's common and conflicting goals. Yes, you are somewhere together because you might be having something in common but at the same time you need to negotiate, you need to come on a common consensus over some conflicting goals which you and the other party is sharing. So yes, Negotiation is a process wherein you state, you discuss, you propose your goals in front of the other party and similar thing happens from the other side and both the parties together they try to come on a common consensus wherein both the parties should be happy or should be able to resolve that conflict. Yes, when we talk about negotiation it is more of a face to face decision making process what you are doing in the negotiation. Yes, of course, you are taking certain decisions 
certain important decisions which are trying to resolve the conflict between you and the other party. So that is what is a negotiation is all about. Now I just want to highlight some of the basic characteristics of negotiation at workplace. Negotiation is a form of interpersonal communication. I hope you are going to agree with me. Remember in the last session we highlighted about the interpersonal communication. When you tends to transfer your ideas, your thoughts, your feelings to the other person and yes similarly the cycle is moving on. That person is going to give you feedback on that and that is how communication, interpersonal communication takes place. So what is negotiation? Negotiation is also a form of interpersonal communication wherein you as a negotiator you are trying to put your points, thoughts across the other person and the other person at the same time is trying his or her best to put his or her thoughts in front of you. So that is what is an interpersonal skill or interpersonal communication. In fact you will be glad to know this that when we talk about negotiation a negotiator needs to have brilliant interpersonal communication skills. The more good interpersonal skills he is having he can judge people, he can know people, he can understand other people as well as himself. So that is again very much required when we talk about negotiation and not just this in fact you will be finding that there is a direct relationship between effective communication and effective negotiation. What do you mean by effective communication? Effective communication is when you are able to transfer your ideas, your thoughts to the other person in the similar manner in which you wanted to transfer and then you are getting the feedback. So that is more about effective communication. So what is happening in negotiation? It is happening the same that you are going to have a sender as negotiator A and he is going to transfer his thoughts to the negotiator B that is the receiver and similarly negotiator B is going to transfer to negotiator A. And the more effective communication skills you have, now communication skills talks about everything. It is more about having good interpersonal skills, persuasive skills, convincing ability, speaking skills, writing skills, everything. And trust me if you are an effective communicator, you are also an effective negotiator. Because you know that at what time, with what level, with what extent you need to put across which thought of yours. Not just this, in fact, when we talk about negotiation, non-verbal communication plays a significant role or you can say that a negotiator, a brilliant negotiator can analyze the direction of negotiation just by observing the non-verbal clues of the other party people. For example, you are going for a negotiation and you with a good smile on your face, you offered a handshake to the other party people who are also for the negotiation. But the other party people, they are not just giving a firm handshake, they are having a closed body language or they are not having a small smile on their face. What is indicated by all this that somewhere or the other they do not want to negotiate in the positive terms with us. So during the negotiation process as a negotiator you should keep a track of non-verbal clues and trust me those non-verbal clues are going to tell you, are going to indicate you that what kind of negotiation or what approach the other side people wants to adopt or are adopting. So you need to be very very sensitive to, the, to all the non-verbal clues which you are getting from the other negotiating party. Also when we talk about negotiation it is dependent on the relative power relationship between the parties involved. It is believed that 
the party, the negotiation party which is more powerful or which seems to be more powerful, the negotiation tends to move in their direction. In the later part of the session, I am going to explain you the factors and there I will be explaining and elaborating this point in more detail. Moving forward, I am going to highlight that what are the preconditions of negotiation. That when I am saying that yes, I am going for a negotiation, so how it can be confirmed that it is a negotiation. So the very first condition which you are going to find is that every negotiation whether small, big or whatsoever it is going to have at least two parties or it can be more. There is some common or conflicting goals of two or more parties. Not just this, in fact you need to have a perceived conflict. Now why this term perceived conflict? Perceived conflict is that conflict can be real or it can be just own, my own perception about the conflict. But something needs to be there if you are going for negotiation. Something needs to be there means that you should perceive that yes, there is some conflict of interest for which I need to go and convince the other party. If there is no conflict of interest, then for what you will be going to negotiate on? For which thing you will be coming on consensus? So, one thing is that you need to have two or more parties involved. Second thing is that somewhere you need to perceive some kind of conflict. Not just the perception of conflict, but that you need to have some kind of interdependency. See, if I am not interdependent on the other party, why am I going to waste my energy in negotiating with that person or with that group? Because I am not at all dependent on that. I can move freely in the market and getting my work done by anyone else. So why I am going into negotiations? So yes, the more interdependency is going to be there, the more you will be talking about going for negotiation. Also, Remember one thing which most of the people, most of the companies tend to forget. They do not go into entering an agreement after negotiation is completed. Remember one point that any negotiation without an agreement is actually incomplete. Because you might have negotiated in the best possible manner and the other party, they agreed to certain conditions as well but you have not formulated an agreement and now the other party is denying that when, when I said yes to these points. So in that case, do you really think that negotiation has taken place? No. So always remember that when we talk about negotiation, an agreement needs to be formulated towards the end. So that's why it's written here that agreement must be required to be reached with reasonable time so that it becomes beneficial for both the parties involved in the negotiation. So these are some of the preconditions of negotiation and you can identify that yes negotiation is going to take place here out of these situations or these conditions are present in the environment. Moving forward, I am going to highlight two approaches for negotiation, the basic approaches. Now again, it depends from person to person, it varies from organization to organization or from group to group that what kind of approach you are going to take care. Because again, when we talk about approaches, it comes with certain positives as well as negatives. So you need to evaluate the pros and cons of these approaches and as per that, you need to apply them. Yes, I will be talking about two approaches, that's integrative negotiation as well as distributive negotiation. I'll start this by integrative negotiation. What we mean by integrative negotiation? Yes, it is also known as win-win negotiation or win-win approach, also called as collaborative negotiation, also known as creating value negotiation. 
Now when we talk about integrative negotiation, this negotiation is where both the parties tries to maximize the benefits for both of them. In win-win situation, what do you do? You try to collaborate together so that things can be moved in the right direction and both the parties should get the maximum benefit out of it. Normally you will be finding that win-win situation or integrative negotiation is being used where you have abundance of resources. There is no resource constraint. So in that case also you go for majorly you will be finding that people go for integrative negotiation wherein I will try to find out the ways that how both the parties, both the negotiating parties can get benefit. So that is why we also say that the inclination in this approach is to maximize the joint outcomes, the collaborative efforts. We try to create value by maximizing the joint outcomes. So this is what is integrative approach for the negotiation. Herein, I am not going to only think about my benefit, my company's benefit. I am also going to think about that yes, with my benefit, what can the other person get as beneficial thing out of this negotiation. So cooperation, sharing information, mutual problem solving are some of the tactics, are some of the strategies wherein we go for integrative negotiation because the idea here is or the approach here is positive. Before going on to the example, I will first try to tell you that what we mean by distributive negotiation. Contrary to integrative negotiation, distributive negotiation is known as win-lose approach. It is also sometimes known as zero sum approach also known as competitive approach and here when I say competitive it is more of the negative competition I am talking about. It is also known as claiming value approach. Now why I am using all these words I will explain you. Distributive negotiation known as win-lose approach. So here the idea behind this negotiation is that one party they always want to win and they will make sure that the other party should lose. Mark my words I am saying that I will try my best to make myself win and at the same time I am going to focus upon making the other party lose. So that is my strategy. Now when I use this strategy of course that is more about negative competition wherein I am trying to demean the other party or I am trying that the other party should not win at any cost. So that is why I said claiming value, I am claiming my value, I am not creating value, I am trying to claim my value and get the maximum size of the pie towards my side and I just want that the other party should get the least size of that pie. In general conditions, you will be finding that when we do have resource constraints, then most of the time parties go for distributive negotiation because the resource is less. So what I want, I want to maximize the size of my pie. I want to maximize the size of my resource. Or in that case, I try that I should get the maximum size and I should make sure that the other person, the other party is not getting anything. So this is what is the approach is all about. Now when I said resource constraint, so yes, you might be finding that resources are fixed or limited and yes, I just want to get the maximum size of the pie towards my end. So also as I said that it denotes it is known as competitive approach. So here it denotes the negative competition between the parties. Negative competition is with the loose spirit wherein you do not want to focus on your energy 
whereas more focus is on making that the other person should not be left with any energy. So again that is a negative concept. Yes, uh, people who tend to have egocentric self interest nature they go on for adapting this distributive negotiation approach. They will never go for integrative approach because they always think about them. They always think about that how they can maximize their benefit. They are never going to think that how I can go on for making the other person uh, beneficial. No, not at all. So, for the same you might get into going for deceptive arguments, quoting wrong facts and figures, going for misinformation kind of strategies wherein you will be somewhere going for quoting wrong things. So, yes you get into deceptive arguments. See we do have two types of things discussion as well as argument. Now, when we say integrative approach, therein you will be going for healthy discussion and when I say healthy discussion, both the parties they will sit together, they will brainstorm, they will try to maximize the gaze, they will try to find out the options for the other party also. Whereas, when I talk about the argument, you just believe that yes, I am correct, rest all are not correct. And when I want to defend this that I am correct, I will be going for deceptive arguments. So, that is why we do call it as win lose approach. Now, when I talk about distributive approach and uh, integrative approach, somewhere I can explain you this with an example of an orange. There is an orange, there are two parties and both the parties want to have that orange. Now, when they are going for some kind of uh, distributive approach wherein they know that it is just a limited resource and I want to get the maximum benefit and they are fighting over the reasons, over the reasons again there are no valid reasons they are coming up with deceptive arguments wherein they want that yes I should get the maximum out of it and towards the end they end up going for that distribution like half distribution, half part you are going to get of the orange and half part I am going to get of the orange. Now, when I say integrative approach, both the parties they will sit together, they will go for the discussion and during the discussion they realized that somewhere or the other party A they only want the pulp part of the orange and party B they only want the outer part of the orange. Now, when they went into this discussion that whatever things party A is doing their work will be done with the pulp part and party B whatever they are doing their work will be done by the outer part of that orange. So, after this discussion what they did they divided the orange in such a manner that party A got the whole pulp part and party B got the whole outer part of that. So, that is the best way, but when we were involved into the distributive strategy we were just trying to focus I should get the maximum, I should get the maximum and in that case what happened you just end up having the half part of the pulp party A got and half part of the outer part party B got because they divided the orange in the half. So, that was more of the distributive aspect and integrative as we should sit together, collaborate discuss and try to find out that how we can maximize the benefit. So, that particular orange was divided in the best possible manner by the integrative distribution strategy or integrative negotiation strategy in the most effective and the efficient manner. So, these are some the two approaches which you can go on for adopting during the negotiation at your workplace. Now, moving forward I am going to highlight the factors which tends to influence the negotiation. There are different factors and they will just influence the way of negotiation, the strategy, the approach of negotiation you are going to adapt. 
Now, the very first point which I want to highlight is the goals and interest of parties. What is the goal? Ultimately, when I say about negotiation, it totally depends on the interest or the goal of the party itself. If party A wants that no, I want to maximize benefits for both the parties, right? I should not only think about getting benefits on my end, I should go on making both the parties win, both the parties maximize the benefit. So, if the goal of your party is this, if you are interested into going for or maximizing the benefits for both the parties, you want to go for collaborative efforts, collaboration, then of course, you are going to adapt which approach? Integrative approach. Contrary to this, if you are a self-centered, egocentric kind of personality, wherein you believe that, oh, I should get the maximum benefit and I should make sure that the other party is losing. In that case, which one you are going to use? You are going to use distributive negotiation approach. Now, moving forward, extent to which negotiating parties are interdependent. Take an example that you are a car assembling company, right? And you take tires for preparing your car from party B. Now, in the region in which you are, both party A and party B, party A is having their car assembling production house and party B tends to produce the tires. You are in the same region, in the same city, for example. And in that city or in the nearby cities, you are not having any other car assembling company. Also, you are not having any tire manufacturing company. So, if party A wants to get the tires for their cars, either they need to go for party B, which is in their city only, or they need to move to some other distant state supplier because in the nearby cities, there is no other supplier available, fine. Now again, when you will be going outside, outside your state, there are again n number of things, n number of complications attached to it, right. You will be increasing the cost as well and n number of things. I am not getting into that depth. But see here, in this example, just because these are the two people who are into this market in, and in the nearby market, they are not having any other customers of theirs, your suppliers of theirs. So, what is the interdependency? Whether it is high or low, it is high that both the parties, they are highly interdependent. And the moment you believe that you are highly interdependent, both the parties, that is the negotiating party A and negotiating party B. Then in that case, you tend to move more towards integrative approach. But where you know that interdependency is low, you will be moving more close to or you might end up moving more close to the distributive negotiation approach because you just know, oh, I am having different players. If they agree to me, it is okay, otherwise they will lose their business, I will be going and contacting other people. So, this is how the approach of the negotiation is going to be linked with the interdependency, that what kind of interdependency you are having. Moving on to the next factor, that is more about the past relationships. Party A and Party B, in the past also, they are not sharing cordial relationships. They are having some, uh, you can say that the relationships are not cordial, they were not good. In the past also, something wrong happened between both these parties. Something, something is wrong if we go into the depth of the past history. Something is wrong in their relationships, either uh, due to business reasons or it can be due to personal reasons. But their relationships are not good. In that case, which negotiation you will be going for? Integrative or distributive? Of course, distributive. Again, see, learners, things can change. 
I am not saying that always you will be going, if you are not having good relationships, you will be always going to go for distributive negotiation. No, my point is not that. My point is just this, that generally we believe that if my past relationship is not, get, is not good with that party, I am not going to think about the benefits of those parties. I am just going to think about my own benefit. I might end up being self-centric, egocentric kind of a person who is just thinking about their own benefits. So majorly or generally you can say that if you do not share good relationships, people tend to move more close to the distributive negotiation in comparison to the integrative one. Now the next point, the next factor is also very interesting factor, the nature the temperament and the personality of the party involved in the negotiation. For example, you are a negotiator and I am a negotiator. I am a person who is having high Machiavellian personality. Who are high Machiavellians? High Machiavellianism is that when a person is highly pragmatic, highly practical, he just wants to reach the end irrespective of whatever may be the means. So if I am a person who is having high Machiavellian personality, high Mac personality, then in that case you might be finding that I am going to talk about only my benefits. I am going to ignore your benefits that whether you win or lose, I don't mind, but I'm just focusing on my winning aspect. So that is more close to the distributive negotiation approach, right? So it is again dependent on the personality of the person that what kind of a person you are. You are a self-centered person, egocentric person, high Machiavellian person. Of course, you will be moving more closer to the distributive one. But if you are more helpful kind of person, your personality is that you want an equality. So if you are that kind of personality positive traits you are having, you will be moving more towards the integrative kind of approach. Not just this, in fact, the place of negotiation, you might be wondering how, how the place of negotiation can decide that what kind of negotiation you are going into or what kind of pace. Uh, is going to be set during the negotiation. Yes, place also plays an important role. For example, if uh, you are going to call the other negotiating party in your office for the negotiation, so where you are, you are in your comfort zone. And the moment we are in our comfort zone, we feel more confident. And that confidence is again certain times becomes overconfidence also and uh, you end up with uh, some kind of negative things because you believe oh I am from this place I can access everything so that tends to depend. So somewhere when we talk about place it tends to raise the confidence of the person during the negotiation but sometimes it tends to make the person overconfident also. So we need to draw a line that okay if that is leading towards confidence that too in the positive manner it is good but if it is going into the overconfidence making our personalities more egocentric self-centric kind of thing then try to resolve it but best idea is that wherever we go for negotiation we should try choosing a neutral place which does not belong to party A or to party B it should be a neutral place wherein we should go. Apart from this, when I say factors, the other factor is about time. What timing? Today some conflict arise and we are negotiating, we are sitting on the negotiating table for resolving that conflict after an year. And after a year, does it really make sense? So make sure that whenever we talk about negotiation, right it should be timely sorted it should be done timely otherwise there is no point there is no point going for negotiation not just this timing the time also reflects the other aspect 
that whenever you are going for negotiation, take ample time. It should not be that you are going for negotiation and just you have only 30 minutes marked for that. Beyond 30 minutes you cannot move. Many a times it happens that some discussion tends to be a bit longer one and with those timelines you are not able to finish it up and then you need to rush to some other meeting. Do not go on for that. Do not plan your meetings just after negotiations that is also again a, an important aspect. So, you need to look for the timing that yes there should be ample amount of time so that you can discuss the things thoroughly. It should not be that you are just meeting for 15 minutes and you want to wind up in another 15 minutes. No, take ample amount of time. So, timing has its two dimensions uh, which tends to set the pace of negotiation. Also, there are some of the subjective factors. Subjective factors like fear. Now, if I am going for negotiation with some other party and what the other party is doing, the other party is trying to make that negotiation environment somewhere more fearful for me by bringing some influential or some kind of people who are into all unlawful activities. So, what that party is trying to do? That party is trying to create a pressure on me out of fear that oh other party they are having very strong links, they are very influential people, I should go according to them, I should not put my points across. That is also one point which tends to decide the pace and the approach of your negotiation. That fear which is being created by the other party through their connections, through their informal ways, through their body language, it can be anything, it can be anything. Not just this, in fact another subjective factor is more about mutual obligation. For example, in past the other party, the other negotiating party did some favor to you. Now it is payback time. You might want to go for win lose approach, but you cannot because now it is payback time. Because once they did good for you, now you need to go do good for them. So, that is what is a payback time. Also, uh, many a times negotiation approach is being set by the future considerations. If I see a good future by going or getting into win lose approach on my end, I want to lose this time because I can see good future considerations, I can see good future plans. So, might be possible I myself I am trying to make myself lose. So, future considerations also sets the pace for negotiation that if I see that yes by getting into the business with this person is going to earn me huge profits in long term, I might allow him to go on for win lose kind of approach wherein he is trying his best to win and he is trying make me to lose and I am losing also and I am ok with this. Why I am ok? Because I am able to see some long term benefits in this. So, that is what is future considerations. Also another subjective factor is about practical wisdom. Practical wisdom is use your cognition wisely as per the situation because every context is going to have different situations. So, make sure whenever you are going for negotiation, attach the negotiation with the context, with the situation, not with the person, not with the negotiating party. Try to associate it with the context, the more you are going to do that, you are going to use your wisdom and yes, the negotiation is going to be coming into your favor only. So, these are some of the factors which you can consider which are going to drive your negotiation pace. So, moving further, I am going to highlight 
the negotiation process. Yes, it is a systematic process, stage wise process you should proceed upon. It is not a process that tends to take place in haphazard manner. It is a stage wise, step wise, predetermined process which you should follow upon. Now, when I say the stages, there are four different stages that is the preparation stage, opening phase, negotiating phase as well as the closing phase. First, I am going to explain you that what we mean by preparation phase. In fact, preparation phase is a phase wherein you are not going for the negotiating directly with the person. This is a phase wherein you are preparing the things, you are preparing the documents, you are preparing the material. So that when you are going for the negotiation, you are having full information. Now, when we talk about preparation phase, it is having certain sub stages. If I start with the very first sub stage is majorly when we talk in terms of preparation is about gathering information. Gathering information. Then after that you go for leverage evaluation, then after that you go for understanding, I will explain all the stages, then after this you go on for uh, repo building. Select the approach and then it is about plan. Now, these are the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 sub stages in the preparation phase. The very first thing starts with the gathering of information. Now, see when you are going for negotiation. Many a times what happens, the biggest mistake most of the negotiators commit is that they go on the negotiation table without preparation, without any preparation, without any uh, information in their hand. And when you are into this situation, you are not going to put your points strongly. So first gather the information, I will explain you with an example. For example, you are going uh, to negotiate over the prices of a product some something some uh, with your suppliers some raw material prices of some raw material with your suppliers fine now you do not have any idea that what other suppliers in the market they are providing what are the prices they are offering what are the concessions they are offering so in that case you might not be coming up with the strong partner for yourself Right. So, in that case always remember that you need to gather information about that negotiating issue. You should know each and every piece of information linked with that. Otherwise, you will not be able to put your points across. Once you have gathered the information, after that in the preparation stage, you need to go for leverage evaluation. Now, for Sure, when you are going for negotiation, there are going to be certain points on which you will be holding leverage, there are going to be certain points on for which the other party is holding leverage. Understand those leverage points. Try to maximize your advantages, try to maximize the points by which you can hold the upper hand over the other party. Also understand his leverage point. Because if you are only going to talk about your strengths and not focusing on the other party's strengths, then might be you are not on the wrong, uh, right track. Why? Because you know your strength, but you do not know that where the other party is good enough. And might be possible, what were your strengths? The other party's strengths are more than you. Then what you will be doing with your strengths? They are just 
not good enough to get you that deal cracked. So for that you should always go on for evaluating the leverage that what advantage is position you are holding and what advantage is position the other party is holding because after doing that you can bring more advantageous points towards your end when you know your points. Then after that try to understand, try to know that who is going to come for negotiation from the other party. Try if you can. See I am not saying that it is possible in all this negotiating situations. But if you can know, if you can try that who is going to be the negotiator from the other party because it is going to help you in understanding that what kind of plan, what kind of approach this other party might adopt. So try to know and once you know, once you got to know, then try to build rapport with them. Try to meet them or in person or over telephonic conversation, but don't discuss anything about the negotiation. Just try to build rapport with them. Just some informal talk. Informal doesn't mean that you will be going for the personal talks. No, not that. But somewhere, whatever you are doing to build rapport, don't just bring that negotiating issue in between before the negotiation because see dear learners this is what is the preparation phase you are doing you are not still you are not on the negotiating table you are just preparing so with that you can build rapport as well not just this now once you know who is going to come you have built the reputation you know the leverage then you can plan then you can select the approach that whether you would like to go for win-win approach or win-lose approach and as per that approach plan your framework that what is going to be your framework how you are going to initiate how you are going to start where you think that you should go on for uh, agreeing to the other party where you should not all such things you should plan plan don't just come and sit in front of the negotiating party and tell him okay give me five minutes to think whether I can do it or not and then you are checking your sources. No, prepare, plan before going for the negotiating table that on what points you can agree and on what points you cannot. Before going during the planning stage, ask questions to yourself as if you are from the other party. That is going to help you out. Now once you have done with the preparation stage then you need to go on for the opening phase wherein both the parties they will meet, they will start the conversation. Now in the opening phase it is always required that both the parties should try to create a conducive environment, a positive environment with positive gestures, positive non-verbal clues, verbal clues and so on. Once the opening phase has started both the parties they are coming across with their points. Now you it is again upon you how you are going. You are going that all the uh, points first party A will tell and then party B will move or you will be coming up with one by one points that pace you need to set up in the opening phase. Now comes the negotiating phase which is the again most important phase wherein you are going to negotiate. You are going to discuss so that you can come on the common consensus. Right? you are coming on to an agreement. Last stage is about closing phase wherein negotiation has been done. But what you need to do is you need to prepare the agreement which is more important and that agreement needs to be signed by both the parties for the follow up actions and all. So this is what is the negotiating process is all about. Now. Moving further, I am just going to highlight that what common mistakes you tend to commit as a negotiator. What you tend to do is you tend to enter the negotiation room with a preset mindset. Don't do this. Go with open mindedness, look for the points and then go on for evaluating things. You should always know that who has the final authority for that negotiation. 
unnecessarily you are going into the discussion you cannot say yes or no and then you are again cross checking it with your head office people no you should know that who has the final authority and you should when you do not know not knowing what power they have and how to use it that is you have not done the leverage evaluation part always do it starting negotiations with only a general and final goal no no be specific be specific concise as well as specific with your goals that what you want be clear with it do not go on for just beating around the bush no losing control over unimportant factors if some factor or deal is unimportant do not lose your control just be calm be composed and yes failing to let the other side make the first offer try that the other side should first make the offer try try to do this do not just go on for coming up with your ideas initially just wait calmly listen what other person wants other party wants and then you hit the ground also ignoring the time and location as negotiating factors is again a major problem many a times people the negotiating parties they tend to arrange their negotiations in some crowded places no not a good idea now when you are surrounded by so many people first thing is you are not able to negotiate properly you are not able, you might not be able to hear or listen what the other person is saying and at the same time your company details might be leaked if you are meeting at some crowded places so you need to think about it not knowing when to start and when to close is again a big no you should be very clear with your communication with your other skills that how and what level you should speak now these are some of the critical mistakes you should go on for avoiding these mistakes apart from this i am just going to uh, talk about some of the more predictable reasons that why negotiation fails there are certain syndromes if i talk about the first one that's the one track syndrome now one track syndrome is basically one negotiator he or she is going to come up with all the points in the logical sequence and they believe that whatever they are doing is actually correct and they will not allow the other party to speak this is also not good you are thinking that yes you are doing it in a logical sequence the other party cannot so that is not a right idea also the win lose syndrome is there among the parties how win lose syndrome now uh, when we talk win lose syndrome it is very clear in your mind that I am going for negotiation and this negotiation is a contest, is a debate and I want to win at any cost. If you are entering the negotiation room with such attitude, sorry, that is a big failure for negotiation. Apart from this, there is another that is the random walk syndrome. Random walk, what you are doing? somewhere you are jumping here somewhere you are jumping there so random walk syndrome is that the negotiators they are not coming up with the conclusions on a point first they are on point a without reaching on to the conclusion they are jumping on to point b there also they are not coming up with any conclusion they are jumping again on to point a or to point c random walk there is no synchronization there is no planning that how we need to proceed and that is why they end up coming up with no solutions after the negotiation. Apart from this the fourth is conflict avoidance rent syndrome. See when I started that what we mean by negotiation somewhere or the other we do have common as well as conflicting ideas. So conflict is there there is conflict of interest when I say that I want to go for negotiation of course there is a conflict of interest just because of that reason only I want to go into negotiation right now what I am doing is I am avoiding the conflict during the negotiation I am trying to come and to talk more about those topics those issues on which both the parties are comfortable and where we I see or where we see both the parties see that yes there is going to be some kind of conflict they are avoiding that aspect what is the point then for negotiation if you are not discussing your conflicts you 
need to discuss that, you are there to discuss that, but what you are doing, you are just avoiding it. So, avoiding is never a good strategy. Last in this is the time capsule syndrome. The time capsule syndrome is basically when one party, they are very honest about the negotiation, they are very clear, they are very serious about the negotiation, they really want to sort the things out, resolve the things out, but the other party, they are taking it okay, they are taking it very casually, they are not seeing the importance of the issues to be discussed. So, what will happen? The party A, they will take it in a very derogatory way or in a negative manner that the other party do not want to resolve. So, this is again also not a good idea. So, these are some of the syndromes which you as a manager need to look forward and you need to move ahead. Now, towards the end, I am just going to highlight that key point for avoiding common mistakes, strategies for making you as good negotiator. So, for that you need to have some skills. If I talk about different skills which you as a negotiator needs to possess, the very first category is general skills which is more about communication, understanding, listening, listening clearly, attentively, focusedly and so on. So, these are some of the general skills which you need to possess. You should be a good listener when you are negotiating. You need to have brilliant communication, tactful. You need to be tactful at the same time. You should know that which information should come at what time. Apart from this, you need to have situational skills. Cross-cultural skills is more about situational. You should know that art of reframing so that you can try to make the other person convinced as per your points. Also, there are certain skills that's moving out of the box. For example, if you are getting into some of the most heated arguments during negotiation, you just go out of the room, relax, stand in the balcony, sip a cup of coffee or a tea to soothe your mind, to calm your mind. You should know this particular aspect that how to maintain emotional stability during the negotiation. That is what you need to master upon. Not just this, in fact, you need to work upon your nonverbal skills, your dressing, right? It is going to tell that whether you are serious or non-serious about the negotiation. Not only the dressing, your physical appearance, not only that, apart from that, your gestures, your expressions, your eye contact, your para language, the kind of space which you share with the other person, that is going to impact the non-verbal skills. So, it is again a big aspect to be taken care of where you need to have all the non-verbal skills which are really required for the negotiation. Last is basic manners. Basic manners is more about being courteous, being grateful, being thankful and when someone is coming for the negotiation, offering him or her a cup of tea, a coffee, some snacks, that is again basic manners. So, these also are the skills which you need to have to set a positive and conducive environment for the negotiation. So, dear learners, I hope you are able to understand the basic concept of negotiation and how negotiation and communication go hand on hand and why nonverbal skills are equally important and uh, for the communication, for the effective communication. Also, in this session, I discussed about the approaches of negotiation, the process, as well as what are the common mistakes which we as managers tend to commit when going for a negotiation. So, dear learners, just focus upon that all these mistakes so that you can remove and you can make your negotiations the most effective one because again, negotiation is the key to success or I should say that negotiation is the key for successful career. 
Thank you and happy learning.